It is August 1941. A pilot in the British Royal Navy, Lieutenant Robert Everett, has volunteered for a bizarre and dangerous mission. He is about to test in combat a wild invention that could defeat marauding Nazi U-boats and save England from starvation. The world's first rocket-boosted fighter. The pilot is going to be under a great deal of stress. This mission is without doubt the most difficult he will ever have faced in his combat career. Everett is flying a one-way mission in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. He is putting his trust in the work of a secret band of maverick scientists. The Allies have recruited to imagine impossible new weapons in a desperate bid to match the superior technology of the Nazi regime. Vertical takeoff, rocket power, stealthy flying wings. This is the untold story of these secret Allied aircraft and the men and women who imagine tomorrow. In the summer of 1940, Britain's Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, is confronted with a major crisis. Nazi Germany has unleashed a new secret weapon against convoys bringing food from America to the starving people of Britain. It is the Fokker Wolf Condor, the first military aircraft able to fly within range of the American eastern seaboard. Churchill christens the Condor the Scourge of the Atlantic. The Condors wreak destruction on a massive scale. In a matter of months, they sink nearly one million tons of Allied shipping. The Condor crews are the elite of the Luftwaffe, mounting their daring bombing attacks at low level. But the Condors have another, even more sinister role. The Condor served two roles for the German Navy. It was a bomber attacking Allied ships, but it also became the eyes and ears of the U-boat fleet, able to spot oncoming convoys and signal their presence to the U-boat commanders. There were areas in the Atlantic where the Allies could provide their merchant convoys with no protection against German reconnaissance and bombing aircraft. That meant in those areas that the, the Germans could send either long-range bombers or long-range reconnaissance aircraft to spot and to direct the U-boats into those areas. And it was those areas that the U-boats had freedom of movement to attack the convoys. This alliance of condors and U-boats threatens to bring Britain to her knees. Winston Churchill admits it is his greatest worry. In desperation, Churchill suggests a daring plan. British and American battleships are equipped with steam-powered catapults to launch spotter planes. Could such a catapult device be installed on the decks of merchant ships to launch fighter aircraft? But no existing catapult is powerful enough to launch a heavy fighter like the Hurricane. So Churchill turns for help to a top-secret research unit called the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough, England. Within only a week, scientists at Farnborough suggest an incredible new way to launch a hurricane from the deck of a cargo ship. It was decided to use a rocket sledge in order to get the hurricanes airborne. And if you think about it, it's the only way you're going to get a fully, fully armed and fully fueled hurricane fighter aircraft airborne off the deck of a merchantman in a very short space. The catapult is powered by a cluster of 13 solid fuel rockets. It is the biggest slingshot in military history since the time of the Romans. But will it work in combat? Launching the hurricane from a ship by a rocket-powered catapult is not as easy as you think. First of all, the rocket had to reach a speed instantaneously that was sufficient to get the plane off the deck, otherwise it would drop into the sea. Equally, the kick of the rocket couldn't be too fast, otherwise the acceleration might break the pilot's neck. The first manned test flight is successful, but there is one major problem with Churchill's idea. Once launched, there is no way the pilot can return to the ship. The principal reason for the introduction of the Hurricane was essentially as a stopgap measure. This is a one-way mission and possibly a suicide mission. 
These hurricanes will be flown only by volunteers. The first battle between a hurricat and a condor comes on August the 3rd, 1941. The pilot of the hurricat is a former jockey and winner of the Grand National, Robert Everett. This will be the ultimate test of Churchill's idea and the most daunting mission Everett has ever faced. I would feel very anxious, uh, not only just getting airborne off that kind of rocket-powered contraption, but then engaging a very heavily armed bomber, and then knowing that even if you weren't shot down, that you were going to ditch in the sea anyway, that kind of mission profile fills me with anxiety. High in the clouds above the convoy, the patrolling German Condor does not see the rocket fire from Everett's launch. It is taken by surprise, but as Everett presses home his attack, his hurricane is damaged by gunfire from the Condor. When Everett closed with the Condor, he discovered a problem. The Condor was bristling with defensive armament. It carried eight machine guns and a heavy cannon, and those soon took a toll of his aircraft. Knowing he is all that lies between the convoy and its destruction, Everett fires the last of his ammunition into the Condor's cockpit. The Nazi bomber goes down in flames, the first to be destroyed by a hurricane. Now Everett faces his greatest test, survival. In a situation like this, you know that if you make one false move, you're not going to survive. If you don't find the convoy, they're certainly not going to find you. You're 40 or 50 miles away, and you could be anywhere as far as they're concerned, in, in any direction. So unless you find that convoy, you are almost certainly dead. His luck holds. By nursing his aircraft to an altitude of 2,000 feet, Everett manages to spot the convoy. He lands on the water near the British ships, but his hurricane soon begins to sink. The hurricane was a very dangerous aircraft to try and land in the sea. It tipped over very easily, and that's what happened to Everett. As soon as he hit the water, the plane flipped over on its back and began to sink, and down he went with it. He had to fight very hard to get the cockpit canopy open, and he was very lucky to manage to struggle to the surface. England's king, George VI, awards Everett the Distinguished Service Order for his feat in shooting down the Condor. Everett is killed the following year while on active service. But the Hurricane ships have turned the tide against the Condors. I think the principal success of the Hurricats was the deterrent effect it had on German reconnaissance aircraft in that after they were intercepted and after the first one was shot down, the Germans were less and less inclined to uh, press home attacks or reconnaissance missions against convoys. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Atlantic, even more bizarre experiments are taking place, some of them literally out of this world. In early 1943, the citizens of Stratford, Connecticut, begin reporting strange saucer-shaped objects flying overhead. The flying saucer is America's first near-vertical takeoff aircraft and the answer to providing ships at sea with fighter cover. It is called the Flying Flapjack. It is the brainchild of a maverick genius, Charles H. Zimmerman. Charles Zimmerman uh, typified the kind of engineer that we saw in the United States emerging and working in the field after the 1920s. America discovered that she was very far behind the European countries in the development of high-performance fighter aircraft. Charles Zimmerman was one of the people who led the drive to make up that deficit. In 1933, Zimmerman joined the NACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, the predecessor of today's NASA. The NACA was an extraordinary organization in that it rebuilt the technical excellence of American uh, technical work. Uh, the NACA created, for example, uh, a far better understanding of how one should design wings. At NACA, Zimmerman's goal is to find the perfect wing shape. As a result, he will design an aircraft that today is still ahead of its time. 
he is fascinated by the notion of developing an airplane that has a tremendous speed range that on one hand would have a very high end top speed on the other hand would have a very low end landing speed an ordinary aircraft wing has a wide span from root to tip in order to create lift this is called a high aspect ratio wing the way an aircraft wing works is by creating different areas of pressure. What this means is that we have the wing here, and as the airflow hits the leading edge, it has further to travel from there to there as it does from there to there. This creates low pressure here and high pressure here. And as the air tries to get from the high pressure area to the low pressure area, it pushes the wing up. But an ordinary aircraft wing has a great drawback. The wide, high aspect ratio wing creates a drag effect against the airflow, which slows the aircraft down. But Charles Zimmerman had an answer. The idea was, why don't I have a much smaller wing, a much lower aspect ratio wing? Narrower wings create less drag and are better for speed. But they too have a problem. When the spill happens over the side of those short, stubby wings, as happens on all wings, the, as the air moves from the low to the high pressure, it causes turbulence on the edge of the wing and therefore reduces lift and increases drag. Now, the effect that has overall on the wing is greater on short, stubby wings as opposed to long wings. To force its way through this turbulence, the aircraft must use up scarce fuel. Charles H. Zimmerman will be the first man to discover a solution to this problem. Zimmerman's solution to the problem is breathtakingly simple. To stop the air from spilling out under the wingtips, he decided to move the engines to the wingtips so that the spinning blades of the propellers push the air back under the wing. With the turbulence problem solved, the narrow wing allows greater speed because of the reduced drag. But the new design has another revolutionary property, vertical takeoff. What he's looking at is something in many ways that's akin to what we would consider the tilt rotor today. His idea basically is to develop what we would call a super stall, a super short takeoff and landing airplane. Zimmerman discovers that the unique characteristics of the low aspect ratio wing combined with the wingtip propellers means the aircraft literally floats off the ground vertically in a stiff breeze. A man-made flying saucer. In 1939, as war clouds gather over Europe and the Pacific, the US Navy orders a prototype fighter based on Zimmerman's revolutionary concept. It is called the V-173. It has a wingspan of only 23 feet minuscule by today's standards. To save time on the test design, a fixed undercarriage is used. The very tall legs allowed for the best angle at which to ensure immediate takeoff. In order to provide a better view on takeoff, the cockpit is extended under the aircraft, so the pilot can look down as well as up, much like in a helicopter. The V-173 flies for the first time on the 23rd of November, 1942, with Vought's chief test pilot, Boone T. Guyton, at the controls. On the very first flight, Boone Guyton had some real problems. The aircraft almost went out of control, but it, it flew so slowly, he got it back on the ground. There, they discovered that the problem wasn't in the design of the aircraft itself. It's simply that the controls had been wired up incorrectly. The V-173, uh, like many experimental airplanes, was an airplane that was not really suited for production itself. It demonstrated the basic concept that Zimmerman was trying to achieve, the fact that you could develop a controllable aircraft that had a reasonable range between low speed and high speed that had all the attributes of a stall aircraft. After some adjustments, the V-173, nicknamed the Flying Flapjack, is soon proving it can do all the revolutionary things Zimmerman has predicted. Facing into a 25 mile per hour wind, the V-173 literally takes off vertically. The V-173 was an aircraft that was a challenging machine to fly, but having accepted its uh, limitations, 
the pilots who flew it were really quite astounded by the high degree of control effectiveness they did have over this configuration. There were occasional accidents during the test flight program. On one occasion, the fuel line of the 173 was blocked and it came down on Lordship Beach in Connecticut, much to the surprise of the local sunbathers. But the plane flew so slowly, almost like a helicopter, that it came down gently on the sands and was undamaged. Meanwhile, in the Pacific, the United States faces the difficult task of capturing island bases and building airstrips. A vertical takeoff fighter could solve these problems. Convinced by the V-173, the US Navy orders a full-scale fighter version of the Flapjack. This new fighter aircraft is designated the XF-5U. It will have a takeoff and landing speed of only 40 miles per hour, but a top speed of 500 miles per hour, phenomenal for any fighter of its day. At that speed, and with its amazing agility, the XF-5U could match any jet fighter in service. The XF-5U is powered by two powerful Pratt & Whitney twin WASP engines. It is armed with six Browning machine guns and can carry two 1,000-pound bombs. But others are now examining the saucer-shaped wing. In secret, in Nazi Germany, work has begun on a prototype machine nicknamed the Flying Beer Tray. The Germans were intrigued by the low aspect ratio wing, but they never actually made the breakthrough that Zimmermann had towards putting the engines on the side of the wings. The prototype fighter version of the Flapjack is finally rolled out of the factory on the 25th of June, 1945. But now a new crisis looms. We were undergoing a radical paradigm shift in aeronautics. And that paradigm shift was from the era of the propeller-driven, piston-powered airplane to the era of the turbojet. The imperative to develop jet engine technology at the end of World War II was very, very strong. Piston engine aircraft design and technology had just about reached the end of the road. In 1946, the XF-5U is finally taken off the secret list. But then the media begins speculating that the unusually shaped XF-5U is a cover for a secret American flying saucer program. This does not endear Zimmerman's flying flapjack to the conservative military. By 1947, Zimmerman had solved all the problems and the aircraft was ready for its first flight. And suddenly, the United States Navy cancelled the entire project and ordered the prototype to be scrapped. What is incomprehensible to me is after having gone to all this trouble and investing the sums of money necessary to bring this aircraft to fruition, the aircraft would be willfully destroyed before first flight because it would have been very, very valuable to the subsequent history of stall aircraft development and uh, subsequent uh, use and employment of stalled aircraft. If we had the data from an aircraft such as the XF-5U-1 to place alongside the data from the V-173. Only in the 1970s did the US military eventually acquire the vertical takeoff combat aircraft Zimmerman had championed during World War II. The British Harrier jump jet was bought by the US Marines as a distant cousin to the chance Vought Corsairs of the Pacific era. Zimmerman's flapjack had been sidelined by the arrival of jet power. But how did the US military acquire its first jets? In August 1939, two weeks before the Nazi invasion of Poland, a unique visitor comes to America for a special demonstration of the latest US military planes. He is Ernst Udet, the man in charge of aircraft development for Hitler's new air force, the Luftwaffe. Udet is unimpressed by what he sees of the latest American planes. Secretly, he knows that Nazi Germany has already begun to build a plane that is light years ahead of America's best the world's first jet fighter, the Heinkel 280. The story of the United States and the jet engine is a story of acute national embarrassment. 
we had several governmental commissions as late as 1939, indeed after the time period when the first jet airplanes were flying, that actually made pronouncements that the turbojet airplane was an impossibility. Yet some far-sighted engineers were already thinking about jet propulsion, despite official opposition to the idea. Lockheed had a reputation as a company that was willing to undertake bold and innovative design. In the Second World War, Lockheed applied this to the turbojet revolution. Lockheed had, for many, many years, a, a very unique engineer named Nate Price, Nathan Price. He was one of the paper inventors of jet engines. He became a believer in jet engines. In the time period where Nate was working on the engine, where we were examining it, and everybody that could follow his notes examined it, and we could find nothing wrong with what he was doing. We designed an airplane to go around two of those engines, a fighter. We had never had a supersonic airplane by that time, and uh, we were reasonably sure that this airplane would probably be capable of supersonic speeds. The aircraft, designed by Nathan Price and Willis Hawkins, is America's first attempt at a jet fighter plane. Called the Lockheed Model L-133, it is designed around a canard layout, meaning the control fins to climb and dive are located at the front of the aircraft. The L-133 has many revolutionary features that make it a decade ahead of its time. It had, in its original concept, an afterburner. And nobody had ever talked about an afterburner in Great Britain or in the United States or Germany that I know of. But the L-133 is never built. Before Pearl Harbor, the United States military is not yet convinced that jet aircraft are feasible. It will take a visit to Britain by a senior U.S. officer to change their minds. In April of 1941, Hap Arnold, who was the, the chief of the Army Air Corps at that time, soon to be the Army Air Forces, goes to England. He says to his host, in, in effect, you know, some of my technical people are telling me, as odd as this may sound, that perhaps we should be looking at gas turbines. And the answer he gets is, absolutely. Do you want to see our airplane? Arnold is shown the Gloucester Whittle prototype, the first British turbojet aeroplane. Nazi Germany is even more advanced in jet technology. Arnold is stunned. Having ignored Nathan Price and Willis Hawkins, America is now years behind. He now makes a bold decision. He seeks out America's long ignored aviation geniuses and offers them big research contracts. His aim? To put America ahead in the new aviation technology. One of the first to take up the challenge is a man named Jack Northrop from Newark, New Jersey. Jack Northrop is an absolutely extraordinary individual. Uh, if you looked at the individuals who transformed American aviation in the 1920s and 30s, and you considered all the engineers and all the scientists, you would have to recognize that the designer and industrialist who did the most to make this transformation a reality was Jack Northrop. Like Charles Zimmerman, Northrop believes conventional planes are badly designed. He asks, why fly with a heavy fuselage? Why not simply have a flying wing and save weight and fuel for longer range? Northrop presents Hap Arnold with a design for a flying wing bomber that can fly to Berlin non-stop from the continental United States, a round trip of 6,000 miles. Arnold immediately orders a test plane. It is called the N9. These are the days before computers, and no one has designed a flying wing that is stable in flight. Jack Northrop has the answer. He attaches special slats to the leading edge of the wing. If the plane flips over, the slats deploy automatically to regain balance. Ground testing of the N9 starts on December the 20th, 1942, only a year after Pearl Harbor. The first flight takes place in the Mojave Desert on December the 27th, 1942. 
Northrop's flying wing is a success. Jack Northrop now approaches Hap Arnold with another bold idea. Why not fit a rocket motor to the N9 and make it into a fighter capable of taking on the new Nazi jets? The first prototypes reveal yet another Northrop innovation. Like the right flyer, the pilot lay on his stomach controlling this aircraft to give it absolutely minimal frontal profile. On the 5th of July, 1944, the rocket-powered version of the N9, called the XP-79A, makes its first flight. America's first manned rocket plane has flown. Now, Northrop had wanted to power this aircraft with a very exotic rocket engine called the Rotojet. But the Rotojet was so incredibly dangerous and its development was so torturous that instead the decision was reached to power it with two Westinghouse jet engines. The Army calls this version the XP-79B. It will embody yet another revolutionary idea. It will be a flying chainsaw. The XP-79, sometimes called the Flying Ram, was an airplane that was armored with four 50 caliber machine guns and it also had reinforced leading edges on its wing because it was hoped that it could actually ram and survive a ramming of an enemy aircraft, typically an enemy bomber. Another crisis looms in September 1944 when it becomes clear the construction of the new jet engine is behind schedule. The Army decides to cancel Jack Northrop's revolutionary fighter. But Northrop knows his flying wing is the key to how aircraft will look in the future. He continues with the project, using his own money. On the 12th of September 1945, only a month after Japan surrenders, the jet-powered XP-79B is readied for its maiden flight. The pilot is Harry Crosby. On its first flight, Crosby demonstrated that the airplane could fly successfully. And then, unfortunately, toward the end of that flight, he had a flight control problem caused by an air inlet valve on one wing not functioning properly. The airplane went out of control. Crosby was unable to escape it and was killed in the ensuing crash. With the destruction of the Seoul XP-79, Jack Northrop abandons the fighter project and concentrates instead on his flying wing bomber. What we see with the Northrop flying wing is a vehicle that's ahead of its time. It's imagineering at its very, very best. Unfortunately, the technology you needed to make it a success, the flight control technology primarily, was simply not available at that time. While Northrop is experimenting with his radical flying wing, Hap Arnold remembers Lockheed's early studies in jet propulsion with the L-133. Lockheed is the logical choice to organize a crash program to build an American jet fighter to take on the Nazi jets. A team of 50 of its best engineers begins to build the new plane under the leadership of Clarence Kelly Johnson. Some, like Willis Hawkins, had already worked on the earlier L-133 jet project. Kelly had promised that the airplane would be flown in 160 days from signing of the contract. And the Air Force had signed the contract. And so we had quite a role to hold. The Army Air Force calls the new plane the P-80 Shooting Star. To save time, the P-80 is a much simpler design than the L-133, but it still uses many features from the earlier project, including its wing. The first flight takes place on January the 8th, 1944. We must have had 20 Lockheed executives of one sort or another, and we all had to sit on the sand dunes. There was no place to stand around. The only paving was the runway, and off he went. And he put on a real magnificent first flight, including a high-speed pass right back in front of the dune. And it was uh, pretty thrilling. But that's how the F-80 was born. The P-80 becomes the first US aircraft to exceed 500 miles per hour in level flight, far faster than Northrop's XP-79B. 
America has entered the jet age. But the P-80 is not designed for naval warfare. This leaves the US Navy struggling to get in on the jet game to take on the Japanese in the Pacific. The outcome would change aviation history. By 1944, Allied naval fighters such as the Corsair had reached the limits of their developmental potential in speed and firepower. But US intelligence sources know Japan is seeking to build versions of the revolutionary Nazi jet and rocket planes. The US Navy realizes it will need its own jet fighters. The main difficulty in deploying the early jets on carriers is to do with their speed. You need a bigger boost off the deck and it's a much trickier uh, landing at a shallower angle and a higher speed on a very small strip. Then the Navy got an idea. Why not develop an aircraft that would have the gentle coming aboard characteristics, if you will, of a conventional propeller-driven airplane, and yet on the other hand, would have the performance potential of a jet airplane. And out of this came the Ryan Fireball, the FR-1, which had a small radial piston engine in the nose and then a small turbojet engine in the tail cone of the aircraft fed by two wing root air inlets. As the US Navy raced to introduce the Fireball, British scientists were working on an altogether more radical solution to these problems. The impetus for their effort was the imminent invasion of the Japanese home islands. The one thing that the British lacked was big aircraft carriers and therefore they would lack air cover for any potential invasion fleet. The answer was an aircraft unique in aviation history. A jet-powered flying boat fighter. It is nicknamed the Squirt. Its test pilot is Captain Eric Brown. It was big for a fighter, but it had um, good performance. It had two axial flow engines and um, well armed, maneuverable. It had everything, in fact, that you really could expect from such a design. Despite its ugly shape, the Squirt could reach speeds of over 500 miles an hour. Because it did not need a heavy undercarriage or complicated arrestor gear to land on a carrier deck, it was actually very maneuverable in the air. But operating from water has a dangerous side. It was a very pleasant aircraft to fly, but I had a, a, a problem occur on landing. I touched down and I was running along at about 100 miles an hour, quite smoothly, when there was a tremendous crash. Brown had struck a piece of wood floating in the water. It shot out like a cannon and struck one of the floats, knocking the float clean off, the starboard float, <clears throat> and the aircraft cartwheeled over. The cockpit, of course, was upside down in the water at this stage. As the plane sank, Brown was lucky to escape. I got out of it all right, and uh, when we looked at the hull after, we found that a hole about four feet square had been cut in the hull by this mast. Hidden among the palm trees on a Pacific lagoon, the squirt could have swooped up to escort attacking Allied bombers or defend invasion craft from Japanese jets. I would say it was a sound concept and if the Japanese or the Far Eastern War hadn't concluded when it did, I think it had been a very useful adjunct to our forces there. But the American Fireball and the British Squirt are overtaken by technology. In late 1945, a pure jet fighter successfully lands on a carrier for the first time. It is flown by the Squirt's test pilot, Eric Brown. But the plans for the invasion of Japan include more than new jet fighters. To fight an aerial war over intercontinental distances, Allied scientists made a leap of technology that still defies imagination. The biggest man-made machine ever devised. And it's made out of ice.
One day in 1942, an unexpected guest pays a visit to Prime Minister Winston Churchill at his official residence in the English countryside. He is Lord Louis Mountbatten, Churchill's chief of combined operations. As it happens, Churchill is in the bath, but that doesn't stop Mountbatten. He goes in and he drops into the water of the bath a block of what looks like ice. Churchill's a bit surprised by this, but he notices the ice is not melting. It's a very special kind of ice. It's called picrate. Picrate is essentially ice mixed with wood slurry. The effect the wood slurry has on the ice is it doubles the tensile strength of ice. Picrate is a super ice, as strong as concrete. Mountbatten's plan is to build giant iceberg aircraft carriers out of this new material. Picrate was the invention of a very eccentric uh, English scientist by the name of Geoffrey Pike. He had discovered by trial and error that if you mixed ordinary ice water with, of all things, sawdust, it slowed down the rate at which the ice melted. Uh, the result was a kind of ice concrete. In the cold waters of the Atlantic, or the Northern Pacific, a ship made of picrate could remain on station for years at a time. Mountbatten wanted a fleet of ice carriers to extend Allied air power across the globe. The advantages of a picrate carrier would be that it provides, in essence, a floating airfield, a whole airfield where you can put squadrons of aircraft. Maintenance levels are low, and the stuff is so dense they are virtually indestructible. But the picrate carrier won't simply be an iceberg, which would melt over time. It will be designed to last indefinitely. The design concept was called Habakkuk, or HMS Habakkuk, and this was to be a floating block of ice which was 2,000 feet long and 300 feet wide, constructed out of 40 feet blocks of picrate. The Picrete aircraft carrier was essentially a giant refrigerator. It was composed of blocks of ice, but through the middle ran pipes, and through these pipes ran coolant. Many times bigger than the Statue of Liberty, Habakkuk would have been the largest floating construction ever built. By comparison, the biggest ship then afloat was the liner Queen Mary, which weighed in at 86,000 tons. The Habakkuk would weigh two million tons. After Mountbatten's visit, Churchill writes a memo on the 7th of December, 1942. He writes, the advantages of a floating island or islands, even if only used as refueling depots for aircraft, are dazzling. The memo is stamped in red. Action this day. But American help is needed for the vast industrial undertaking to construct Habakkuk. At a conference of senior Allied commanders held at the Hotel Frontenac in Canada in August 1943, Mountbatten decides on an extraordinary method of selling Picrete to Admiral King, head of the US Navy. During one session of the Frontenac conference, Mountbatten brings in two blocks of ice. One is ordinary ice, the other is picrate. Suddenly, Mountbatten takes out his revolver and he fires into the ordinary ice, which just kind of splinters. Everyone is completely confused by what Mountbatten is up to. And he takes his revolver and he fires at the picrate, which is so strong, of course, that the bullet bounces off. In fact, it ricochets into Admiral King and, and nicks his leg. Fortunately, Admiral King is unfazed, and as a result of this unorthodox demonstration, the Americans agree to help build a prototype of Habakkuk. Driving down from the Aleutian Islands, a fleet of Habakkuks could launch both fighters and giant B-29 bombers against Japan. Building the Habakkuk and its sister ships would avoid the need to capture Japanese-held Pacific Islands as land bases for the B-29s. Tens of thousands of Allied lives would be saved in jungle fighting. But the ice ships are never launched. The money and resources needed to build them are diverted to other projects. The project was eventually cancelled for a number of reasons. I think the first of which 
was because the war was at that stage being won by more conventional methods. A lot of conventional aircraft were coming on stream uh, and so the tide was turning against Germany and also against Japan. By the time the prototype of the Pike Creek aircraft carrier was ready, the war had moved on. America was already building the atomic bomb. It had already started to build large numbers of new aircraft carriers. In effect, time had run out for Pike Creek. The day of the Maverick Inventor was drawing to a close. The need to develop revolutionary new technology was now taking second place to winning the war by less risky methods. America's vast industrial powerhouse was churning out thousands of fine conventional planes every month, and small escort carriers could be mass-produced by the hundred, giving the Allies the vital platform they needed to dominate the seas. But the ice ships, although never launched, have not been forgotten. Since World War II, there have been numerous proposals to build commercial ships or indeed floating islands made out of picrete. The latest idea is to build such an island that would house what would be an independent community, free of other governments in the world and uh, free of any kind of taxation. World War II saw the birth of a whole range of radical new technologies. In the frenzy of innovation, not all projects were successful. Some failed through lack of support or resources, some because of technical limitations, and some because they were ideas just too far ahead of their time. Many of these secret Allied aircraft projects didn't make it into combat, but that's not the point. They were the products of great minds willing to think outside the obvious and that's what creates the spirit of progress. These are individuals that are facing real-world crises and challenges. When you understand what they were trying to do, sometimes these design choices, as flawed or as odd or as weird as they may be, uh, start to make a lot better sense. And it is very surprising sometimes when you see how these return in very dramatic form many years later in much more successful fashion. Charles Zimmerman's original flying flapjack was stillborn, but his dream of vertical takeoff has inspired aircraft designers ever since. When you take a look at the tilt rotor that you see today with the V-22 or the XV-15 that preceded it, these are really the technical heirs of the kind of approach and work that we first saw undertaken by Charlie Zimmerman with the V-173. Another World War II maverick who lived to defy the odds was Jack Northrop. After the war, he tried to build more fantastic planes for the military, including the XB-35 flying wing bomber, originally planned to bomb Berlin. But the military remained skeptical of flying wings that were difficult to control in pre-computer days. After World War II, uh, Northrop built a large flying wing bomber and this proved very successful. Yet again, though, it was too radical for the military, so it was never put into production. Uh, and that cost Northrop a lot of money. As a result, he lost control of his company. But Jack Northrop would have the last laugh. Before he died, he was taken to where Northrop was working on the B-2, and he looked at the assembled uh, individuals there who in included a galaxy of Northrop designers and engineering personnel, and he said, now I know why God has let me live so long. Northrop's World War II flying wing is the direct ancestor of the B-2 Spirit stealth bomber, which flies over the Mojave Desert exactly where its predecessor first ventured into the skies. The B-2 will still be in service on the 100th anniversary of the legendary XP-79. In the end, Northrop and his fellow Mavericks had proved one thing. Genius is the ultimate weapon. <laughs>